So today we're gonna to be talking about choosing the perfect audience for your web design agency. Now, my name is Adam McLaughlin, and of course I use WordPress. That's why we're here chatting at WordPress Montreal. You can see my Twitter QR code down there. That's where I hang out. If you'd like to call it X, I won't hold it against you, uh, but you can always use the QR code and connect with me on Twitter. I would love to chat with you there. I'll give you a little bit of a background on me. This is a picture of my family and we are living our dream and uh, we get to travel full time. We've been traveling full time since 2018. And that's because we built our WordPress agency around recurring monthly revenue. So all of our clients are on a monthly service contract and they pay us every single month, which means that we don't have to go and find new clients every single month in order to generate the revenue that we need um, to travel. And so you can also see the QR code in the lower right corner. My wife said I could only speak at this conference as long as I uh, showed off our family Instagram. So if you'd like to follow our family adventures, you could do that, the QR code uh, in that bottom corner. Now at the end, we're gonna talk about questions and I love taking questions. So one of the things that I do whenever I speak at a conference is I say about a third of my presentation has to be set aside for questions. And today the organizers at WordPress Montreal, WP Montreal have given me the opportunity to take questions. And so this is my little guy in uh, Bath, England. Uh, this is a replica of a statue and he asked, can I put my finger up its nose? And so if you have an, a question that's just as exciting as my little guy's question, then I would love to hear it from you at the end. We're gonna make sure we have lots of time for questions. Okay, so we are adrenaline junkies. This is my wife and our three boys getting on a roller coaster. We love roller coasters, but we hated roller coaster revenue. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my business model, and it is service-based websites. Websites as a service, but you might be less interested in that model. You might be more interested in a custom web design agency, and that's totally cool as well. Either way, we're gonna talk about how to choose an audience for your web design agency. But I'll give you a little context for my agency so you understand where we're coming from. I started designing websites in 2011. And in the first few years, between 2011 and 2019, I had done all custom work. Uh, and I'll give you some examples. I did some custom work for a British pub, a limousine service, a plumber, a realtor, a French fry shop, a furniture store, a yoga studio, and some summer camps. So between 2011 to 2019, I did about 80 custom sites is what I built during that time. And at the end of that seven-year period, I had about... Uh, sorry, eight year period. I'm practicing my math too while I'm here. I had about 20 clients that said yes to my managed services. So hosting, regular updates, tech support, troubleshooting, you know, all that kind of stuff was built into our managed service. So during that first eight years of my business, I got about 20 clients who paid me every month to manage their website for them. Then in 2019, I completely shifted my business model and I shifted it to growing recurring revenue by building templated designs for campgrounds. So from 2019 to 2022, I brought on 80 clients. Now to build or to populate a templated website, it took me about four hours per site. And those 80 clients meant that I also now had 80 clients on monthly recurring revenue. So I switched from the up and down roller coaster of peaks and valleys of gaining uh, clients and then losing, you know, or not losing, but um, getting a deposit and then building their custom website. So no income while I'm building the website and then getting the other half of the deposit once we launch the website and then no income while I find the new, the next client. So I did this roller coaster up and down uh, of revenue until 2019. And then I started building websites specifically for, in this case, campgrounds. And so now every time I bring on a new client, I'm adding to my monthly recurring revenue. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about more about this business model and, and why I love it and why this business model works really well when you are clear with your audience, but I'm sure you're gonna be able to take the same ideas and the same principles and apply them to your custom design uh, agency as well. Now, before we get back into that, I am gonna check the comments because I'm not able to watch the comments while I've got my screen on full screen. So I would love if you can uh, let me know, hide the screen share notice, please. Can you hide the bottom bar? Ah, Tom, you can still see my face too. Okay, best of both worlds, I suppose. You can see me waving my hands and also you can see 
the uh, screens as well. Possible hide the screen sharing notice, please. Okay, I'm going to try that and um, I'm going to keep going. Let's see if I can hide that notice. I do see the hide button and we'll, we'll try and make sure that that doesn't uh, stop the slides from showing as well. So um, I've lost my mouse, so I'm not sure how to hide that. Okay, here we go. Let's try hiding it here. And then, uh, okay, there we go. I think we've got it. Okay, so just so you could see what, what that screen share button was hiding on the right uh, side of the screen, 2019 to 2022, I brought in 80 new clients. It took me four hours to populate their templated websites. And that gave me 80 clients on a monthly recurring service contract. So my first eight years of business, I brought 20 clients on that had a monthly service contract. And in the next two or three years of business, roughly speaking, I had 80 clients now on a monthly recurring service. And that's what allows us the stability and the reliability to travel full time. So here's the model. Um, and again, this is my business model. And we're going to talk about the first step of that business model, which is choosing a target audience. And you will be able to take that and apply it to your custom design agency if that's uh, what you, you're cho choosing, or you can use it as the first step in building a website as a service or a service-based industry where we're not building custom websites. We're basically populating templates um, and providing value for the clients on a monthly service contract. So the model is to choose an industry. The second is to create WordPress templates for that industry. So now as soon as you've chosen that industry, you know what that industry needs. You know the kinds of pages they need. How many pages do they need? What do the pages need to say to get their audience? What kind of call to actions do they need? So we create a WordPress template for that industry. Next is that we sell the templates as a website service for $0 up front. Then we repeat and do it over and over and over and over again. And we build that monthly recurring revenue by selling that same service contract over and over and over to others in that industry. Okay, so how do you start when you're building that ag ag agency? That's the recurring revenue model. First, we're going to choose an industry. We're going to market to that industry. And those are the two steps that we're going to talk specifically about today. How do you choose an industry and how do you reach that industry? And then the other steps there, so creating services for them, pricing your recurring revenue or pricing your, your service, selling the websites, creating repeatable procedures, how you outsource and scale, and then uh, creating outstanding customer service. And really at the end of the day, that's the reason our clients stay with us because we provide incredible service, which means that it doesn't make sense for them to want to switch. And hopefully it never even crosses their mind to want to switch because when they send us an email, we reply uh, right away for them. So today we're gonna talk about those first two in that list, choosing an industry and marketing to that industry. So why a single industry? I hear this so many times from web designers and I understand because in my first eight years of business, I wanted to do websites for anyone in our little town in Canada, in, in Ontario, Canada, that wanted a website. So again, we go back to that British pub and the limousine service and the plumber. So why choose a single industry? Well, the reason is focus, right? Now, there's so much skepticism when somebody is making a big decision, and especially if you're thinking about uh, serving small businesses, they a website for them could be a big investment. And they want to know that you're the expert in that field. They want to know that you understand their industry inside and out. And so they could go to old Adam and they could have somebody who, you know, had built a website for a restaurant and a, a website for a plumber and a website for a realtor, or they could go to the new version uh, the new agency and say, hey, these are the people who are the experts in building websites for my field. And so your portfolio now grows to lots and lots of clients that are already in their field, the people with the same pain points that they have. And it creates this sense of expertise for you um, and your agency if you are focused on one specific industry. Okay, so now let's dig into the nuts and bolts of choosing that one specific industry that you're going to you're going to uh, choose for your agency, you're going to serve with your agency. So there's four kind of 
options or four approaches that I've found have worked really well when I've been mentoring agency owners. So the first option is an industry that you've enjoyed working in before. So this could be you know, a uh, summer job you had, this could be straight out of college, this could be something that you've really enjoyed working in before. And because you've worked in that industry before, you probably know the insides and the outsides of that industry. You know the ins and outs, you know the behind the scenes, you know the pain points of what the owner of the business in that industry is looking for, and you can speak directly to them. I'll give you an example. I worked at a restaurant for a year between high school and college to save up money for college. While I was there, uh, uh, somebody came in to give their resume to the manager and they walked in at 12 o'clock on a Friday uh, during lunch hour and they handed their resume to the manager. And then the manager looked at them and very politely said, thank you very much. And as they walked out the door, the manager put that resume in the garbage. And I asked, I said, they look like a, you know, a sharp, track, sharp dressed person, you know, great attitude, great smile it seems like they might be really great for the restaurant. And the manager said to me, Adam, if somebody walks in at noon and tries to speak to the manager at a restaurant, it's a very good indication. They don't know anything about the restaurant industry. And I'm not interested in training somebody who doesn't even put in the foresight to understand a little bit about the job they're applying for ahead of time. And I thought that was really interesting. That stuck with me. So you know, if you know a specific industry inside and out, you probably know when is the time to speak to the decision maker. What are their pain points? What are the things that they're looking for? And how can you solve those problems? The second option is an industry that you grew up around. Now, you probably inherently know some of the things, the ins and outs of an industry, even if you didn't work in that industry. But maybe your parents had a business or your cousin had a business or your aunt and uncle or grandparents. And so you kind of could make some pretty educated guesses about the kinds of ins and outs of that business specifically. So an industry that you grew up around. Now you could probably also pick their brain and you could say, hey, here's what I'm looking to do. I wanna create digital marketing solutions or websites or digital marketing packages with websites as the core of them or whatever it might be um, to serve this specific industry. Can I pick your brain about what what your pain points were or, or, or what interests you had in getting new clients or what kind of things the customers were looking for. So an industry that you grew up around or you could pick somebody's brain who knows about that industry. The next one is a hobby where you know the industry inside and out. So maybe the hobby is uh, maybe you're a musician and so you can help build websites for music schools or music teachers or music uh, stores, you know, a hobby that you know inside out. Maybe you love golf, so you understand how things work at a golf course. And so maybe that's a great industry to go after uh, for your agency. The next is if you bring on a salesperson or partner with a salesperson who already knows an industry, they bring the credibility of knowing the ins and outs of the industry and possibly some sales experience. You know, somebody who's semi retired from an industry might already have contacts in the industry. They might be able to uh, make some introductions or do the sales themselves. And you can look after the back end um, in your. Uh, agency. So you look after building the websites, maintaining them, making sure that they're serviced. And that person looks after connecting with the industry, speaking their language, and really being the face of the credibility of your agency. So those are four options. An industry you've enjoyed working in before, an industry you grew up around, a hobby where you know the industry inside and out, or partnering with a salesperson who knows the industry. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take that industry and we want to divide that industry or we want to section down that industry into a segment of a segment. So we don't just want to say, hey, we're going to build websites for restaurants because the challenge with doing that is the website for the steakhouse or the marketing for the steakhouse is very different than the marketing for the sandwich shop. And so we have to think a little bit differently. So we're gonna try and segment down. Okay, so now you're gonna choose a segment. So for instance, we're not gonna do steakhouses. We're going to just do sandwich shops. Okay, we're gonna segment down one more past that. We're going to choose a specific segment of that segment. So here are some ways that you can narrow your industry down by segments. Uh, one option is by geography. So, you know, for instance, you might choose New York State 
or you might choose wherever you're local to, or you might choose where an industry is really well established. So for instance, if you're going to sell websites to golf courses, there are golf courses everywhere, but there are a lot of golf courses in the Southern states where snowbirds might go for a few months over the winter. So maybe you're going to choose that as your segment. You could segment down by product or service offering, whether somebody is organic, whether they're offering specifically premium brands, whether they're offering a budget brand or they're offering American made or Canadian made or locally made or whatever that case might be, that could be your segment. Or you might segment by uh, customers. So by families, by kids, by singles, by couples, you could choose a, a segment that serves a specific demographic again, based on the industry that you choose. And because you already know that industry inside and out, you could probably already start to think of some of the segments that might be helpful or might be specific or might be well served by your web design agency. So we choose a segment of a segment. Now, what we're gonna do is we're going to apply this thing that I like to call the 120 five rule. Now, please, somebody think of a better name for this. I use this system when I'm trying to help people figure out if their industry is suitable for, um, you know, their segment of a segment is, is enough of an audience to serve with their web design agency. Somebody please come up with a better name for this, okay? Taking suggestions for better names in the comments. Um, but the question goes like this, how many businesses make up 100% of your of your industry, of your segment of a segment, then could 20% of those businesses use a website as a service? In my case, website as a service, you might be doing custom. So you might be looking at a custom website um, project. So some of those people in just about any segment of a segment, they might have a head office, they might be a franchise, they might have multiple locations, they probably already have a marketing team on staff. So could the question is could 20 percent of those businesses use a website as a service and then the five part is if five percent of the businesses in those industries became service clients could you build a sustainable business so what is a hundred percent of that segment of a segment could 20 percent of those businesses actually use your website services and if five of them became clients, could you build a sustainable business? So you need to kind of guess a little bit ahead. What would my price point be? What would be realistic for that industry? So for instance, if you were going to go for premium golf courses, maybe their monthly service package for their website or their digital marketing is $5,000, $10,000, $20,000. Maybe that's not the same as a local community golf course, right? That's a different segment of a segment. But the local community golf course, they might not be doing the whole digital marketing package, but they say, listen, I can do $200 a month for a website that brings us new clients, new golfers. Okay, great. So again, you have to try and figure out what is that 5% of the business and what is my price point going to be? And will that actually build me a sustainable business? So to try and simplify, I'm going to give you a real life example and um, put it in real term perspective. So here's my example. So I'm going to talk about pizza shops in New York. So here's my industry. Uh, so my hundred is there are 5,719 pizza shops in New York state. As of when I did this homework, I uh, just checked up on it last week. Okay. So that's my hundred. What is the 20? So about 55% of pizza shops are independent. So 45% are franchises, the pizza huts, the dominoes of the world. Um, and so could 55 or could 20% of pizza shops use a website as a service? Well, the answer is yes, because 55% of them are independent. And I would assume a good chunk of that is people who don't have a marketing team. You know, independent could also mean somebody who owns five locations, you know, not quite a franchise because they own them all themselves and maybe they already have a marketing team, but definitely. 20% of those pizza shops in New York state could use a website. So that works on the 20% rule. 5% is 285 restaurants. Okay, so now this question is, could I build a sustainable business with only 5% of the market? So the segment is, or the industry is restaurants. The segment is pizza shops. The segment of a segment is pizza shops in New York state. So could I build a business 
off of 5% of pizza shops in New York State. 285 restaurants. Well, let's do a little bit of math on that one. 285 restaurants at $200 a month service plan is $57,000 a month for your web design agency. So I would suggest that yes, that is a reasonable amount uh, of gross revenue for an agency to be able to sustain a functioning business. Now we haven't talked about pizza shops in Ohio or pizza shops in Florida or pizza shops are in Canada or in Ontario and, and then in Quebec and then the rest of Canada and then the rest of North America and Mexico and then expanding into Europe. We haven't talked about any of those. This example is just narrowed down to pizza shops in New York State. So there is tons of potential outside of your segment of a segment. So the question is, now what? So now that we've got our 100, our 20, and our 5% rule in place, and we know that yes, we could build a sustainable business with $57,000 a month gross revenue. Now we wanna talk about how are we going to reach that target audience? Right, so we figured out our target audience, but now we have to figure out how do we get in front of them? And so there are lots of different avenues, which ones make the most sense? Well, there's blogs, there's Facebook groups, there's podcasts, there's email newsletters, there's YouTube channels, there's conventions or associations or organizations. So what I recommend is to find somebody who has already made an audience out of your segment of a segment. So, for instance, in New York State, again, just to go back to my example, in New York State, there might be an association of restaurant owners or an association of pizza shop owners. That would be even better, right? There might be a, uh, a podcast for pizza shop owners. There might be Facebook groups for pizza shop owners in New York. But there's also somebody out there who supplies all the pizza boxes, who supplies the best cheese, who supplies the best pepperoni, who delivers the supplies to the um, New York pizza shops. Uh, there's somebody out there who fixes the pizza ovens locally when they break down. <clears throat> there's somebody out there who is already connecting with your target audience. So the best way to connect with your target audience is to get in front of somebody who's already connected with them, somebody who's already built that audience, provide that person a value. So can I guest post on your blog? Can I sponsor an email newsletter? Could I be a guest on your podcast? Could I give away a free ebook to everybody on your list about 10 ways to increase your pizza shop revenue? How can you get in front of people or how can you connect with people who've already built an audience out of your segment of a segment? And there's so much that we could dig into in this one and so many strategies and options, but really solving the question of who is my segment of a segment, that starts to make it a lot easier when you're trying to figure out where are you gonna put marketing time, where are you gonna put marketing dollars, where are you gonna put your focus? because now you're going to try and get in front of the people who've already built your audience as a list. The next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna build a marketing website, a portfolio website that shows off, you know, all the things that you've done and the services you provide and your pricing and your website as a service and what's included, all those things, but you're going to now make it speak to that target audience. So before you may have been ABC websites, and now this time you're going to be pizzashopwebsites.com. Okay, you're going to try and speak directly to that audience. Now you don't have to say pizzashopaudienceinnewyork.com. Really anybody who has a pizza shop can come to you. But that segment of a segment helps you really create focus when you decide where you're going to put your marketing dollars and where you're going to put your marketing effort and time and focus. So... Anybody who has a pizza shop can go to pizza shop websites. I'm just using that as an example and connect with your service for pizza shops, but you're going to spend your time focused on New York. So in that marketing website, we need to speak specifically to your target audience, everything from your domain name, the names of your packages, your imagery, your call to action, your blog content is all targeted towards the decision makers in your segment of a segment. You're even gonna have good and better best templates built specifically for them. And we do this so that a client can choose, you know, what are the things that suit their industry? So for instance, uh, let's 
talk about the pizza shops in New York, you might have uh, some pizza shops that do only takeout and some pizza shops that do table delivery. So maybe there's value in having a separate page all about the inside of your restaurant specifically or how to make a reservation or, um, you know, special events coming up on the calendar, whether there's a, a game on that you're going to be showing on the TV and you're inviting everybody to come hang out for that. All those things are different than somebody who just has a takeout restaurant. So a good, better, best template if in our case is typically like, you know, seven or eight pages is a, in a good space. Eight to 10 pages is in a better space. 10 to 12 pages is the best template. So not something entirely different, but just a little bit larger depending on the actual business that, that you're going to be serving and, and what their needs might be. So here's an example that I put together. This is something different from New York pizza shops altogether. So we could just see outside that box for a minute. But and you can go to this. This is at coffeeshopwebsites.net. You can check it out. Um, so again, the imagery talks about where, you know, uh, that kind of stone brick coffee shop feel that so many people are going after right now. My content says we're coffee shop lovers and website builders. We go together like cream and sugar. And then the call to action, contact us, contact us, sorry, to get started on your coffee shop website. So everything about this website needs to speak directly to coffee shop owners, including the domain name coffeeshopwebsites.net. Okay, we've got one more slide and then we've got Q&A uh, and we're back to, Daddy, can I stick my finger up his nose? Yeah, okay, whatever, I don't care. Q&A, one more slide and then Q&A. And the reason I stick this slide in before the Q&A is because we almost always, I say we shouldn't have, we, I almost always get asked this question during Q&A. So I wanna answer it now before we get to Q&A and then we can dig into some other questions. So what do you, Adam, what do you include in that monthly service? So our monthly service includes hosting, it includes WordPress management, things like updating themes and plugins, um, removing deprecated plugins, finding replacement plugins if that happens. It includes the subscriptions to premium plugins and themes that are applicable to the industry. 60 minutes of design time per month. They just send us an email. Hey, we need this change. We need this new picture uploaded. We need our office hours adjusted or here's our new rates. And uh, it also includes uptime monitoring. So again, we want to try and catch a problem with the website before the client catches it. So that is often a question that gets asked uh, about our monthly service. These are the things that we include hosting, management, premium plugins, design time, and uptime monitoring. Okay, so uh, we're going to go to questions. I'm going to move the slides off my screen so I can actually see your questions. And just give me a minute while I stop the screen sharing so we don't get the uh, infinity matrix thing going on here. And uh, I'm going to stop sharing. And I hope you can see me. Um, by the way, I'm in a hotel room right now. We're actually in Glasgow, Scotland at the moment. So um, that's, you know, this isn't my house that looks like a hotel room, but uh, that's where we are and that's what we're doing. So I'm going to take a look at your questions here and uh, let's uh, take a look and see uh, what uh, I can answer for you. So Jacqueline's asked, how do you position yourself as a better alternative to something like Wix or Squarespace? Do you, fall, do you find small business owners are even aware of these services and that they can build a website themselves? If so, what messaging do you use to show that you're a better option? Jacqueline, this is a great question and not uncommon that, that this shows up. And now in the realm of AI, I think we're going to probably get to a point at some time soon where you can say, hey, AI, build me a website for my bowling alley. And next thing you know, it's it's going to kick out some kind of website. There's a difference between helping a client see a website as uh, the, the solution and helping the client see a website as a tool, right? Lots of small business owners think to themselves, I need a website, and then they'll go on Wix and build themselves a website. But what they don't know is they don't know, is this actually bringing in customers? There isn't an opt-in. I'm not building my email list. I don't know if this is working. I see Google Analytics. It seems like there's some traffic to the website, but I don't know if there's actually any people coming from the website into my business. And so you have to position yourself as a strategist now more than a website builder, right? If you're just a website builder, yes, you're an alternative to Wix. If you're a strategist who says, we're going to build a website 
and it's going to do these things. And we're going to measure those things. And we're going to show you that what you invested in the website is shown multiple returns because you get this many people placing orders, you get these this many people coming into your business. Then you're going to want to stick with us to, to stay with us for a website service. So you have to see yourself as a strategist who uses a website as a tool to get your clients results, then you have to show them those results. That's something Wix can't do, something AI won't be able to do, at least right away. <laughs> Eventually, probably. But uh, in the meantime, you know, those tools do exist. You're always going to get somebody who wants to use those tools instead of hiring uh, a web designer. But if you position yourself as a strategist and one of the things that you do is web design, then you're going to see a lot more success when you have that conversation with clients. Uh, I hope I answered that question and please feel free to leave a follow up. Uh, Anna asks, could it be a good strategy to start by doing work for everyone to ensure that you have revenue and then learning which clients you could apply this more automated approach, then only take on new clients in this segment of a segment? That's a good question. A lot of people that I work with have a custom design agency. So they get their deposit and then they don't make any money while they build the website. And then they they launch the website and they get the other 50% of their deposit. And then they don't make any money until they're finding new clients and a new project. So it's this roller coaster revenue. And that's why they come to me and they say, hey, Adam, how did you do this thing where you took people um, to do a segment of a segment and create a monthly service contract so you have stable, reliable, monthly recurring revenue. And so my answer to those people is keep doing what you're doing. You're making money in custom work. Take maybe one day a week and start this segment of a segment with service packages for that segment of a segment and eventually build your recurring revenue over time. Because, you know, the first month I did this, we made $264, which is something, but not enough to pay for our family of five to live. Uh, it's barely enough to pay for my family of five to get groceries for a week anymore. Um, so it does take some time to build up that recurring revenue. Um, and yes, if you're doing custom now and it's working for you, you could do it and then take some time every week and build up that recurring revenue. Okay. Second question, Anna asks, has this model and price tag been hit at all by the ease of other platforms to people use uh, themselves like Squarespace? Okay, so that's the same thing as we want to position ourselves as experts for their industry, and we want to position ourselves as strategists. There are always going to be clients out there who want to DIY their own website. That's inevitable, and that's always been the case. Um, Squarespace makes it easier for them, but they don't necessarily know what they're doing. They're just dropping in some pictures and text. So again, position yourself as the expert and there will always be a piece of that audience. Like again, to build a substantial business, we're only looking for 5% of that massive market. So if 20% of that massive market are Squarespace users and 50% of them don't need a website because they're a franchise or something like that. And the other 30%, they've got um, you know, their cousin's going to build them a website or they're going to hire a custom designer because they want a custom website for whatever reason. Again, we only have to go after 5% of that segment of a segment, that very specific market, um, in order to have enough clients to run a sustainable business. Once you've got the 5% of the pizza shop owners in New York, again, just as an example, then go after pizza shop owners in Ohio and pizza shop owners in Georgia and pizza shop owners in Michigan and pizza shop owners in Ontario and pizza shop owners in Quebec and pizza shop owners in Alberta and start expanding and expanding and expanding. And if you just need 5% of each of those markets and one of those markets is $57,000 a month, you can see pretty quickly how this scales and expands even by just continuing to laser focus on you know a little tiny segment of a segment. Uh, and then next question from Anna, how do you overcome the 20% that already have websites if they're bad websites? I don't, uh, if they come to me, I'm happy to explain to them what I could do better. Um, and maybe there is an approach where your um, email opt-in could be a free website evaluation. And so you're gonna send out an email list to the Pizza Shop Owners Association of New York and offer a free website evaluation. A bunch of people sign up, they send you their website and you send them an evaluation. And maybe some people recognize that their website is bad and needs work. Maybe some people don't. Again, they could fall in the 20% that I never talked to because I could build a large, sustainable uh, and reliable business on 5% of that segment of a segment.
uh, number number four uh, or number five. Would you or did you share these slides? Also, this whole talk was brilliant. I'm happy that you would. Uh, here's what I'll do. I'll give you my wife's email address and you can let her know that you enjoyed my talk and it was brilliant because she doesn't give me that kind of credit. She's my biggest fan, which means she keeps me humble by going, ah, it could have been better. But uh, uh, I would I would be happy to share these slides. We're going to figure out a way to do that. I'm going to contact the event organizers and give them the slide package and they'll figure out how to how to let you know that they're available. Thank you, Anna, for those questions. Uh, Mark asked, do you have an onboarding or setup fee or is it only the $200 a month? So Mark, we can get a website live based on a template in four hours. So we charge $0 up front for a couple of reasons. Number one, I can outsource the website at four hours at $25 an hour. Somebody's doing some copy and paste. They're doing a little bit of mobile formatting, of course, depending on the content, and they're choosing in some pictures. They're happy to do that in four hours at $25 an hour. So I could be profitable in the first month when the client hands me 200 and my cost was 100. So we don't do an onboarding setup fee. That's the first reason. The second reason is that uh, we found that as soon as we charge something up front, the client sees it as a product. And we really want them to see their website as a service, not a product. Because as soon as you buy a product, you think to yourself, I've already paid for this. Why do I have to keep paying for this, right? If I have to pay $1,000 up front, then why do I have to keep paying for this every single month? And we just found that the sales process was a lot easier and the retention was a lot easier if we do the $0 up front and the $200 a month, for example. Um, each industry might have a different price. And I will throw in a bonus there that we do ask for a 24 month minimum commitment for our clients. Uh, obviously we don't wanna go through the work of setting up their website and have them only stick around for two or three months. Uh, we want the opportunity to show them that our service is reliable, that it's quick, that it's fast, that it's knowledgeable. Um, it takes a little bit of time to make sure that we do that. And we also find that after the 24 months, most clients just keep their service contract and it, it continues we don't have clients who typically go, oh, 24 months is up, time to end my service contract. Uh, okay, Joshua asks, what is your advice for approaching a potential customer after you've done all the research, have templates, et cetera? So again, I'm gonna look for uh, the opportunity to get in front or to use or to leverage an audience of people um, or of somebody who's already built my audience. Sorry, I'm gonna start that one over. I'm going to try and find somebody who's already built an audience out of my segment of a segment and help them or pay for them or sponsor them to get that audience in front of me or to get in front of that audience. So being a podcast guest, um, putting an ad in an industry magazine, it sounds, might sound odd that you, I'm a web guy suggesting we use print, but if somebody doesn't have a website or somebody has a poor website, they're probably also that person who reads that industry magazine still, uh, or sponsor an email newsletter or be a podcast guest or write a blog post, a guest post on a blog. You know, somewhere out there, there's a marketing blog for pizza shop owners. So you could write a blog post about, you know, 13 things your website needs to have going into 2024. That's an example. So my uh, advice for getting in front of that audience is to find somebody who's already built that audience and leverage the fact that they've already built that audience. Um, after approaching, your question might be a little bit more specific about approaching those potential clients. So what I like to do is offer a free website evaluation because um, most websites check some of the boxes, right? So you might come up with 40 things, you know, do they have an SSL certificate? Is their WordPress up to date? Um, have they removed any excessive previous users? Is their, is their website mobile friendly? Is the phone number clickable? Uh, is there a logo? Is the contact information on the homepage? You know, these, these might seem like really basic things. But if you say to a business owner, listen, I've got a free 40 point website evaluation and I will look over your website and figure out what checks the boxes for that evaluation and what needs to be improved in order for you to be presenting your business as best as you can online. Then a lot of business owners will go, sure, I'll see it. Next, I'll go through the evaluation and I'll reply to them. I'll say, hey, good news. You've got 37 out of 40 things are firing on all cylinders on your website. 
But these last three things, they could use some improving. Let's talk about how we improve those. And that's when they say, well, what's that going to cost me? It's like, well, actually, we could do it for zero dollars up front. We give you a brand new website, checks all the boxes and, and explain your monthly service package. So that's how I would approach a potential customer is I love the option to offer them a free website evaluation and then come back to them because they've opened the door to a conversation about, OK, so you got X number of things uh, are doing perfectly well on your website and there's some opportunity for improvement on the other you know, three or four things, for instance, and here's what it would take to improve that. And you already know going into the conversation what it's going to take to improve that. Okay, Anna says, let's see, you've answered the other questions, I think, with a focus on strategy and niche, 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 niche. If you expand, you outsource that 60 minutes per month of work. Uh, eventually, that's something you could do. Again, depending on your industry, um, in, in our industry that we started with uh, in 2019 in campgrounds, um, we would find that people would contact us maybe once or twice a year. They'd say, hey, we did some new landscaping. We'd like some new pictures or we're updating our rates for this season. And most of those changes take 15 minutes. Um, so typically in a week to service, you know, 80 to 90 clients right now uh, in that campground industry, we are I'm taking about eight to 10 hours a week um, to service those clients. So right now that happens by myself, but for sure something you can uh, outsource. And as we grow and as we expand, I'm definitely going to be looking to outsource those things uh, so I could focus on growing into new niches, niches, industries. Let's just go with industries. And uh, But yes, you you can outsource that work. Uh, I don't have the need to yet, so I don't, I don't do that yet, but hopefully grow there soon. I didn't realize when I was joining this talk that I'm already doing this. Great, Mark. That's great news. I started my general design business in 2005, but in 2019, I started a second niche design business doing exactly what you teach. Great. Within two years, it became my primary source of income. Great. This strategy works. Great. Mark, I would love to connect with you. I would, I would love to hear more about your story. Uh, if you can track me down on Twitter, that would be great. Uh, if you use Twitter, uh, otherwise, I'm, I'm also on Instagram. And uh, I would just love to connect and, and hear more about those specifics and some of the things you learned along the way. Uh, birds of a feather like to stick together, so they say. Uh, what sort of onboarding does the client go through, Mark? Uh, good question. How do, how do I get their content? So because you are building a template for a specific industry, you know all of the things that need to go into that template. So our onboarding form walks through all of the steps. So some obvious ones like what's your address and you know phone number and office hours and all those types of things are all on the onboarding form. Um, and the onboarding form takes about eight to 10 minutes uh, for a new client to fill out. And if you're having a challenge getting the client to fill that out, you can do it on the phone with them. So you call them and say, hey, I've just got a few questions so I can get your website started. You open the browser, you fill it out themselves. It's a great way to, way to get their actual content if they're dragging their feet themselves. And then the only other thing that we ask for is we ask for uh, their photos. And often that's the more challenging part than the eight to 10 minutes uh, of the onboarding. Not because they don't send photos, but because they send vertical photos with their finger over the lens most of the time, uh, because that's exactly what we want on their website. So I, I would guess that would be the biggest challenge. Uh, but we do use an onboarding form and the onboarding form nearly is copy and paste to the WordPress template that we've created. So your websites are WordPress. How do you stop customers from logging in, creating a backup of your site and running away with it after the first month? Uh, we don't give them logins, <laughs> so that's one way. Um, but you know, at any point in time, some other designer could open. We use Divi. They could open a Divi template. They could create something similar. They could, you know, even if they don't use Divi, they could use whatever they want. Create something similar. Copy and paste our content. Uh, I guess there's no real way to there's no real way to warrant against that. Most clients, that has not been our experience. But I mean, I, we can copy and paste text from just about any website. And then, you know, at $200 a month on a 24 month contract, we're looking at about $5,000 total over two years. Um, frankly, it's, it's really not worth it taking them to court for that. We, we would basically just walk away. Um, but we try to position ourselves as the expert. So they see us as an expert and they don't end up, uh, you know, going to somebody else who's then going to charge them three or $4,000 to recreate the website uh, when we did it for zero dollars up front on a monthly service plan. But we don't give our customers logins. 
That's the, that's the, the long and short of it. How do you market yourself? Oh, uh, Joshua, how do you market yourself to a business as a younger person with limited real world experience? Ah, great question. So this comes down to how well you know the industry uh, and how you position yourself ahead of time. Um, what I would suggest is, again, if you have concerns about business owners taking you seriously, you need to create credibility quickly. A couple ways to do that. Number one is on your website, you have a video of yourself talking about your specific experience in the industry. So, hey, growing up, my mom and dad owned a golf course and I saw a real need in golf courses for X, Y. And so this is what I do for clients now because I know the golfing industry inside and out. By the way, my name's whatever. And uh, I'm going to be the one who contacts you as soon as you click that button below and ask me for a free website evaluation. So that's what I would do is establishing credibility as quickly as possible. The other thing you could do is you could partner with somebody who might be semi-retired um, or who might uh, know, again, back to knowing the industry inside and out. You know, For instance, if you're going to sell websites to golf courses, you might find somebody who wants to be semi-retired who used to sell fertilizer to golf courses or who used to sell irrigation systems to golf courses or who used to do you know, the, the maintenance for golf courses. They have credibility in the industry. If age is a factor, they might have a, a better connection with a business owner. Um, but I think at the end of the day, credibility is the key. And I think you will find, Joshua, I'm assuming that this is one of your students asking, uh, correct me if I'm wrong on that assumption. I think you will find that a lot of business owners, when it comes to technology, they're interested in having somebody much younger get involved. You know, They typically will recognize, hey, these are the people who know social media better than I do. You know, They know their phone inside and out. A business owner might say, I can't even get my camera open on my iPhone. Um, meanwhile, these people are getting millions of views using the camera on their iPhone. So I don't think age is as much of a concern, but as quickly as possible, you need to establish reliability and credibility because those are the things that are the concern, right? I can hire somebody who knows how to do Instagram really, really well, but when I need changes to my website, are they gonna be more interested in spending time on their friend's Instagram and TikTok videos than they are on actually servicing the website that I need serviced and updated? So again, credibility and reliability, two big things to establish upfront. And as you build your portfolio, it starts to sell itself. You know, when you have 70 or 80 websites in your portfolio in your specific industry and client testimonials from people in your specific industry. Now it just becomes a matter of it's nearly order taking at that point in time. You know, I want a website. You're the person I want it from. When could you get started? So um, great question. Thank you. Uh, Jay, do you include any marketing, uh, marketing automation, funnel features or KPIs? Uh, that is going to be dependent on each specific industry. And I think that is a great way to expand your service package offering. So you could do things like creating an email newsletter every month for your clients. You could do social media management. You could do blog content uh, to increase search results. Um, there are all kinds of things you could add on to your service package in order to, number one, increase your dollar value, increase your profitability, but increase the list of things that you're offering to your clients and the likelihood that they are going to see uh, a tangible return from those things. As far as KPI goes, I would always recommend finding a way to track the results that you're getting for your clients and show them those results and the end you know, the profitability of those results. So, hey, you know, every time I bring you a client, it's worth $1,000 to your business. Last month, I brought in 12 new clients. That's equivalent to $12,000 for your business. Again, just round numbers. And your service package is $2,000 a month. So your service package for $2,000 a month brought your business $12,000 in gross revenue, which I know at a 50% margin is $6,000 in gross profit. So congratulations, your investment with me last month tripled your investment, you know, profitability. So again, always showing those things and adding service packages where you believe that the investment in that service package is going to be uh, much more profitable for the client than uh, the cost to them. Okay. Jacqueline, totally agree. Worked with a lot of people who see tech and websites as a scary new thing and youth can sometimes build trust. 
I will hire a young salesperson who knows what they're doing any day uh, over somebody who is stuck in their ways, but has gray hair <laughs> because that's, that's not the results I'm looking for. The results I'm looking for are, are sales results. Do you get pushback from clients about the fact that sites can look a bit alike when you get a big client base since they're all template based. Hey, great question. I love this one. Uh, for us, you know, the, the industry that I started in was campgrounds. So uh, my wife and I RV when we're in North America. And so we spend about six months of the year in the, in the States and six months of the year in Canada in our RV again, when we're over there, when we're going to Seattle, for instance, we're going to look for uh, a campground near Seattle. And when we're going to Montreal, we're going to look for a campground near Montreal. When we're going to Quebec City, a, a campground near Quebec. And when we're in Calgary, a campground near Calgary. I don't care if the website of the campground in Quebec looks the same as the campground in Seattle. I don't really care. And I probably won't even notice because I look at that many websites in that industry so often. Uh, and, and that's an example. Now, will your client care? Well, that's a different conversation. So... What you have to say to them is we're going to customize the website with your logo, with your colors, with your picture, and with content specific to your campground. We are using a template, but you know, between us, we also know that WordPress is essentially a, a, a pre-made box that we could put all kinds of different things in. And so we're using a template because we know that that template brings results for our clients. And we know that you want results. You don't just want a pretty looking website. You want a website that actually brings you customers. And so we're going to use a template that we know has worked for other customers. And in light of that, it's going to be completely customized to your logo, your color schemes, your photos, and your text. So for most clients, that's not a concern. And in fact, we have clients who have, um, you know, in the campground space, they have eight or 10 campgrounds and they're all on the same template and they don't really care because the logo looks different. The pictures look different. The text looks different and they're in different physical locations. So they're near different cities and they're really just caring. Does this customer or does this website bring me new clients uh, when somebody's looking for a, a business in my area? George asks, uh, George says, great session. Thank you, George. What platform do you use to manage all your clients on? We use iThemes Sync. Um, and, oh, this is a question for my tech guy, Rob. Um, we use iThemes Sync and we use uh, uh, some like uh, site admin or something like that. I'm really sorry. Tell you what, send me an email, adam at... Uh, freshideawebsites.com. Let me see if I can. Ah, okay, I just put it in the chat. Adam at Fresh Idea Websites. Send me an email, George, and ask me that question, and I will get my tech guy to let you know what our tech stack looks like. Also, if anybody else has a question that you didn't want to ask publicly, uh, or if you want a copy of my notes, let's just do this. Send me an email, adam at freshideawebsites.com, and say, hey, can I get your keynotes from WP Montreal? And and I'll I'll make sure that I get that to you. Ha! There we go. <laughs> I just killed George. You helped me kill two birds with one stone on that one. Okay, Tom, do you offer? Tom asks, do you offer hosting and that type of tech maintenance as part of the package, or do you keep the hosting package separate and in the client's name so you're not your directly responsible for downtime and other acts of God. Uh, we do put our hosting into our own service package because we don't want the client to go to have to go somewhere for hosting and somewhere for their domain registration and somewhere else for their tech and somewhere for you know changes. We want them to come to us for all of those things. And so we roll the dice or we take the risk on the back end pieces um, because we want to be the client's one pivot point. We don't want to complicate things. If their website goes down, we don't want to have to tell them to call an 800 number. We don't want to have to, you know, we want to take that off their hands, for instance. Um, in my case, we have our own hosting. We don't use a, a third party hosting. Um, sorry, I shouldn't say that. We have our own Oh, this is another one for my techie guy. Okay, we have our own server that is managed by a company local to Woodstock, Ontario, where where uh, 
I started my business where we lived before we started traveling in 2018. So um, I, I can call them directly. Uh, they don't have an 800 number because I, I can call them directly. They look after our hosting is just for our server. And so we have a lot of control over that. We do have installed a redundancy, uh, a fallback. And we do that, even though that there's a more extensive cost to that, we do that again for that reason. You know, how do we mitigate potential downtime, keep clients happy and keep them on their service package for as long as possible and keep them paying for as long as possible. Uh, okay, I love that you spin it with pragmatism, approach and results, return on investment. Yes, all those things. Well, thank you everybody for uh, chiming in, for asking questions, for hanging out today. If you have any other questions, now would be a great time to ask them um, or to leave a comment. Let me just see if there's anything else here in the questions. Um, and if there's something that you need or you have a follow-up question, again, hit me up on Twitter. Would love to hang out with you there. Or send me an email, adam at freshradiowebsites.com. And uh, I would love to chat with you. I do, uh, uh, I love World Pre WordPress World. And I love helping people get off the roller coaster of their revenue and build recurring revenue. And I would love to answer any questions you have about that chat, get started. Um, and we will uh, talk to you soon. Also, let me know where you are. And if I ever get a chance to be in your area, I would love to connect with you. And the best way to do that is on Twitter. And I post where we're going and, and where we are. And then you can be like, hey, Adam, you owe me coffee. Uh, come hang out and we'll, we'll chat. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. Uh, I appreciate your time. I appreciate your questions. And I look forward to continuing to watch you grow and take this information and uh, and build that agency of your dream. Thanks. Have a great day.